And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to coming to us with the Amethyst Dragon's Horde of Everything, a grab bag of additions to D&D 5e. The man formerly known as the Amethyst Dragon, but for the purposes of brevity and because I'm not paid by the syllable, the man known as Nathan. How are you doing today, man? <laughs> I'm doing well, and yourself? I am do I'm doing good. It's a, it's a nice Sunday afternoon that is a little too sunny for my taste. I prefer um, cooler climates. Oh, where are you at? Uh, Minnesota. I am right next door in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin. My sympathies. <laughs> it's not bad. I mean, I'm literally right across the Mississippi from Minnesota. Yeah, but you, yeah, but you still have to deal with the smell of Packer fans. I don't mind them. They're they're fun. They're unique. I'm I'm not a big I'm not a football fan myself, but. The Packers and the Packer fans are something unique. There's nothing like them in the NFL. Or I, across I the know. Country. It's just, just <laughs> being being across being across the state line. I have to make I have to make my jokes. Oh sure, because Vikings Packers. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that well that and pretty much every, pretty much every team in the Midwest hates every other team in the Midwest. I know it, it's weird. I mean, we well, all get winter, and we all. <laughs> Well, we we all have winters and mosquitoes. So. Keep in mind, back in the day, it was called that. Um, part of things was called the black and blue division. It makes sense. Uh, most mostly because mostly because you had a, you had a bunch of people who were will, willing to throw willing to throw hands as <laughs> well. It's a contact sport. Uh, although, do although. Although the ice bowl was was a special bit of hell back way back in the day that was pre merger era, uh, I'm not the I'm not the most massive sports guy, but I like weird stories, and some of those yeah, weird yep. stories involve sports. Uh, yes, the it's or even some even sometimes just whole this whole ep whole episodes of stories can be written about the art of the choke job. <laughs> oh, you know what? One little mistake, and then the whole the whole thing falls apart. Oh, I can always I can always give Falcons fans a thousand yard stare by just bringing up twenty eight to three. Yeah, see that one's that reference is lost on me. That that was that Super Bowl a few years ago where they blew a twenty five point lead. Oh, all right, oh. I. Can't say I've ever actually watched a Super Bowl. I've seen lots of the commercials. <laughs> yeah, well, everybody has. Uh, they make whole playlists get made just for those. But I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Oh boy. Um, okay, so back in seventh grade, uh, this was about thirty five years ago because I'm getting up there in years uh my best friend at the time uh had read some of the early forgotten realms novels um and i read them too because he had them and i i was a bookworm uh and one of his relatives gifted him with some first edition AD D stuff advanced dungeons and dragons and a set of dice mm -hmm. um, and he was the dm and i was the only player neither of us really knew what we were doing um, but it had swords, it had dragons, it had magic, and I was hooked from then. That was it. <laughs> uh, I eventually I started like DMing in high school. Um, you know, for myself, my br my younger brother, my friends, uh, did it part way through college, did it after college. Um, you know, by then I'd switched to second edition. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pretty much when I got when I went to buy my own books, second edition was out. Um, ran that forever, 
uh, in 2000, third edition came out and I bought the player's handbook at Gen Con that year. And then it sat on a shelf for a whole year uh, because I, I had already made up a ton of stuff for the game over all those years. And I'm like, I don't want to update all my stuff. That's so much work. And my group's already comfortable with second edition. Eh, but, you know, I have the book just to have it. Well, one night, about a year later, I sat down, I read through it and went, oh boy, I am switching everything because this is so much more streamlined. Um, and then I ran that forever, ran an online version. Called, uh, there was a game called Neverwinter Nights, mm -hmm. uh, which is based on third edition. Um, and it's the clo it's still the closest thing you will actually find to a computer game version of Dungeons and Dragons. And this thing came out in 2002. There was a sequel to it. Everyone writes too. I never got to play that because my computer's not good enough. Um, and then, you know, I got burned out on that after uh, like 15 years or so. <laughs> uh, and came back to tabletop D&D &D, and 5th edition was out by then. So I completely skipped 4th. Because I never had a reason to to get it. It just wasn't a, a thing. You know, my game computer game was third edition and then right to fifth. Mm -hmm. And I've been making I've been making up stuff for the game this whole time. And so with fifth fifth edition, I learned that hey, this stuff is called homebrew now. Uh, and I started making that and publishing it online. And then well then there was the uh uh I, the collection just kept growing and growing and growing. And soon I had several hundred things that I'd made. Uh, and my wife and a couple other people had said, you should write a book, put this all together in a book and sell it. I'm like, eh. And then I did. And then I'm like, yeah, yeah, actually I'm going to, I would like to have this in a book at my table that I can hold. And so I started working on it. Mm -hmm. That was a couple of years ago. Oh yeah. I can, I can certainly, get that um oh. especially especially since as um as i've told as i've told other people in the past nobody plays uno as written <laughs> you show me someone who plays uno exactly as it's written in the with the rule set verbatim and i will show you a liar so i think i have actually once <laughs> which all I can think of is the Johnny Dangerously line of "You should, you shouldn't kick me in the balls." My sister kicked me in the balls once, once. <laughs> but it's more, it's more that home. In my opinion, home brewing is an inevitability. Oh, um, it's just a matter. It's just a matter of time. Oh, it's a game of imagination, and you're always going to come up with things that Wizards of the Coast has not. Mm-hmm. Or, or in some, or in some, whether it be through wanting to do things a certain way or just being dissatisfied with certain certain decisions, I can definitely see yeah. that. Uh, Let me alter this. Let me change up this. Let me twist this so I, it's how I want it. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful thing about D and D and role playing games in general. I ended up having to make a bunch of spells just because, for because well one one of my one of my characters was supposed to be an ice mage but mm -hmm. there but there are so few spells that deep that deal with cold deal with cold whether it be through damage or effect <laughs> you got like frost ray cone, cone of cold blizzard not a whole lot else yeah uh probably reason a few years ago i made a bunch of them mm -hmm. <laughs> so well let's see one two three four five six seven eight nine oh it's only a dozen mm -hmm. so with now with that in mind obviously there's a lot to, there's a lot to go into and if we went to things individually it'd be it'd be a bit it'd be a bit insane oh god mm -hmm. it would be hours to talk about everything that i've made and put in this book in yeah. the, the book i've made and i'm crazy but i'm not that crazy <laughs> so what i'd like to do what i'd like to do instead is try and hit some some of the highlights with certain parts oh um, sure yeah so i think i think one of the first things is 
on the on the racial end of things. You've got four revised um, races and two new ones. And when it comes right. to revised, is it just a case of adding new adding new um, subtypes within it, or is it complete overhauls? Uh, with the revised ones, what I basically did is I took ones that like in the standard game are basically like here you have Dragonborn, for instance. Here you have Dragonborn. That's it. They all have the same stats and everything. The only thing that changes is their, the type of their breath weapon and their damage resistance. That's the only difference. So what I did is I turned them into a base race and then I split off the uh, chromatic and metallic ones and gave them each their own sub race basically and those have different stat changes. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a difference between like, you know, a blue dragonborn and a bronze one. You know, they got the same breath weapon, the same resistance, but they'll have like a little stat bonus difference. And then um, I've added four elemental based ones because my personal game world doesn't have uh, Genasi, Genasi, however you you pronounce it in your own world. Um, but I like the idea of an elemental infused player race. Um, and I thought dragons work really well for that. So there are four different elemental uh, based dragonborn. And mm -hmm. so that's, I revised the dragonborn race to make it a base race and split it up. And then I added to it. And the same thing with half elves and humans and orcs. Um, mm -hmm. Because I got rid of half orcs and I just replaced them with orcs, but I gave them half orc stats because the half orcs were so much better than orcs. Um, and I just see orcs, they should be tougher and they should be more threatening. <laughs> yeah, I could I could certainly see that. And as far as the two, the two newcomers? Now, the two newcomers, uh, I have, uh, I call it the Hajitu is, uh, the G2 are a type of ogres in my own campaign world of Aenea. They're bigger, they're stronger, and they're sm a lot smarter than regular D&D ogres. Um, and I made them, this is a, there's a, a half ogre race then basically, um, like a magical mixture. So these guys are, this is, they're large sized. Um, they can be like 12, 13 feet tall if you want them to be. Um, uh, but they are a large sized race. So there's some mechanics that go with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't give them, uh, sub races. Like it looks like the, the Goliaths and D and D are getting for the new version of it. Um, but because it's a, it's a new race and it's very distinctive at the moment. Um, and it's not based on all these giants. It's just ogres, these particular types of ogres, which are also in the book. Uh, and then I made up the beast folk because you have, you know, like in, in the base game, you got like tabaxi and the, the, the heron gun. Hmm. I like to pronounce it as heron gun because they're fast. Um, but I made my own beast folk that kind of like unites various uh, mammal based ones under a single race so you got bear folk boar folk cat dog hyena mouse rabbit raccoon and squirrel folk um all under the same under under beast folk that why i'm not dealing with flyers i'm not dealing with you know cold-blooded and hot-blooded i'm keeping it all general as mammals that could you know if you give them hands because basically they have hands in this um and they're bigger and and smarter and stuff, but uh, they're still definitely more, you know, anthropomorphic animals. Mm -hmm. So you're not just like slapping, you know, you know, cat ears on a person. It's 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 more the animal than uh, than humanoid, but yeah, yeah, I they can count for the game. I can certainly get that. So I mean, you can certainly expand on it. Say, yeah, I want uh, I want uh, a bovine folk, so I can have my minotaurs. I want my, you know, <laughs> you can certainly expand on it. But uh, I, I figured this was enough of a start to have uh, nine sub races to it. Mm -hmm. I call them ancestries in my book, species and ancestries, because well, I was a science teacher. I'm, I, you know, species works for me more than races because they're so difference i see races more like like humans where it's like gee we're di there's some different colors from different places um which is basically the same the 
you know, same people basically. Um, whereas like with D and D there's like mechanical differences with, you know, these ancestries. So, uh, I've, I've never made, I've never made too, <laughs> made too much, made too much on, on the matter. I just, it's just as a term has to be used and no, if you're if you're throwing left-handed, no matter no matter how much training you do, you'll never be able to fully throw with your right hand with your right hand at the same level. Uh huh. Unless you're one of those weirdo amb ambidextrous people, <laughs> which um they don't count. Uh, um, I'm totally jealous of people like that. Oh, and well, they're they're highly valued in in stuff like baseball because that's how you get um, switchers. Yep. Even if there's one. Unfortunate incident in the minor leagues where a switch hitter and a switch pitcher were at opposite ends of each other and chaos <laughs> ensued because neither one could agree on which side to um, start with. Yep. I mean it. It was a couple. It was a couple. No, but it was a couple minor league teams in the New York area. I think one of them was from Staten Island. One of them was from Brooklyn. Because, it, but because they kept sw because they kept switching sides <laughs> when they were setting up. All the umpires had to come out and just stop the game while they figure out what to do. Because <laughs> technically speaking, they weren't doing anything that was breaking the rules. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's it's just what are the odds of this kind of thing happening? Exactly. So eventually, it was decided in that in that kind of situation, pitcher has priority. There you go. Oh, uh, you know the best way to break a rule is for it to never to not be there in the first place. But totally. Now, since you have since you have about a hundred and eight subclasses in this thing, uh, obviously going through all of them would be we'd be we'd be here until we'd be here until Christmas. Uh, yep. <laughs> so instead, I'm operating under the assumption that each each core class is getting at least one. Each class is getting at least two, and in fact, the only one that's getting two is actually not a core class; it's the artificer. Mm -hmm. So, um, with the, with that in with that in mind, I would I would like to I'd like to go down the list of the class list, and you can give me what you can give me one or two um, subclasses that are going to be in the book, what their playstyle is going is going to be, and and so on. Sure. All right. So. Since you brought it up, I'll start with that one, the Artificer. Okay, the Artificer, uh, the first one it gets is called the Dragon Forger. Um, and this actually goes back to a couple of years ago now. Wizards of the Coast was coming out with a, a, a dragon-themed book, the Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, thir I heard there was a, two, a whole two subclasses in there. Two. That's it. For a book of dragons and so i decided i'm going to make a dragon themed subclass for every single class in the game except for sorcerers because they have one in the player's handbook the dragon forger was one of them and they uh basically make magic items or devices or whatever that duplicate dragon powers and they're they're really a combat focused uh artificer they got this harness and they attach things to it so they can have like clogged gauntlets and they can have a tail that they can attack with um uh a, a helmet that they can get a bite attack with eventually they can do a thing that'll give them a breath weapon and wings and armor that'll protect them and they can add elemental damage to their attacks uh it's, it's basically like how do i duplicate being a dragon but with equipment so that's what the Dragon Forger does. Uh, and then the Sapper's Battlefield Manipulation, uh, building and destroying fortifications, changing the landscape, using siege weapons, and uh, they get a, a special explosives that they can use. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the two Artificer yeah. ones that are in the book. And well, the only, the only rule you need, to under, you need to follow when it comes to explosions is P equals plenty. <laughs> yep. Oh, I mean, some some might some might say that that may include friendly fire. To which I say, uh, there is no friendly fire, just fire. 
It can, yes, that can definitely be. Uh, they have a little more control over it because it's like a, a thing that can place and then ignite later or, or detonate later. So, you know, it, it's more uh, the demolition side of it rather than, uh, you know, and fireball, for, fireball, for, fireball. For whatever reason, I'm thinking of the demo man in, in Team Fortress 2. <laughs> Possibly, I haven't actually played that game. <laughs> his whole his whole thing was either was was either um, bouncy grenades or sticky grenades. Fun. Uh, and if any, if anything got in the if anything got in the way of the explosions, well, they're explosions. <laughs> uh. You, you got to be careful with explosions, or not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's always that character who's a little bit too zealous when it comes to when it comes to their explosions yeah i I imagine uh i I play overwatch so i'm thinking of junkrat Mm -hmm. uh except you know the sapper's a little more disciplined Uh, (laughs) oh i though when i've i've done i've had my fair share of characters who are very are very much built built around explosions or built around traps um even to yep. the point of ha- of asking if I could have a spell made called Summon Anvil, which if you've seen any Chuck <laughs> Jones cartoon, you know how it goes. You yep. don't. It doesn't. It doesn't appear in front of you from thin air. It appears in front of you after after about a after about a second. Just don't look up. Mm-hmm. Oh, but next, of course, would be barbarian. Barbarians. A man uh, I'm gonna too do angry it. to die. Yes, uh, I'm going to do a couple of them here. Uh, let's see, one of them, uh, the Path of the Inner Demon, is not about being possessed by an actual demon or holding an actual demon inside of you. It's more the metaphorical demon, the psychological one. Uh, and this one, they have, you know, it's a it's a person who, in their everyday life, they put on this mask of being happy and civil, but there's also always that anger inside them, uh, and they let it loose on the battlefield when they rage. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's beyond just like a normal barbarian rage. It's a, it makes them feel good, and they're actually like harder to control when they're raging because you know it's 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 finally free. Uh, and at higher levels, after the rage subsides, they actually feel better and they actually heal after they rage because it's such a relief to them. Uh, and that one came about. Um, because one night I was driving along and I had Spotify on shuffle and two songs came up back to back randomly that both fit together. And I'm like, that sounds like a barbarian. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, Jekyll and Hyde from Five Finger Death Punch and Bodies from Drowning Pool. And they just happened to come back to back and inspired a subclass. Yeah. And- when you when the way you describe the whole inner demon concept, I was very much thinking of the strange case of Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. Oh. But and then uh, let's see, let's go with another one. He- oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, I, no, I, no, you're good. Okay. Uh, and then another one is totally a joke because it started as a joke. Um, in a D&D session that I was in, uh, you know, what do you call a, 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 a barbarian who doesn't eat meat? Well, he's a vegetarian barbarian or a vegibarian. So that's the path of the vegibarian. But I take these things and I turn them into things that are actually functional in the game. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't make, you know, even if something is relatively silly as a basis like this, I make it actually work. Uh, so the vegetarian can use plant matter, no matter its actual like consistency as a lethal weapon. Mm-hmm. So you could, you know, take a, uh, you know, a giant tomato and it is going to hurt when used by the vegetarian or like a, a, a large zucchini as a club. It's going to do a lot of damage. Because that's part that's the built in thing. And also it plays off on, you know, like uh how the vegetarian diet is so much better for you. Well, the vegetarian has an ability where they can uh basically put somebody down in the middle of battle because they're not, 
you know, clearly they're not following a superior diet and it makes the other person actually worse at fighting. Mm -hmm. So it, it's fun. It's funny, but it still works in the game. And, and I do that in, in several places. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, my, my idea of, of D and D is it is a game. It's supposed to be fun. We have fun at the tables. So I put some fun things in the book as well. Mm hmm. So, next, of course, would be the bard. Bards are fun. They are varied. Um, uh, let's go with, for the start out, the College of Dragon Song. This is another one of my dragon themed ones. Um, and these bards, they get a, 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 a miniature dragon companion. And it helps them out. Uh, it can help them out in battles. It can help them out in social situations. And um, it's more than a familiar. It's They're definitely a companion. Um, and it gets stronger as the bard does. And later on, they can actually, you know, do some of their own spell casting. I think that's how I did it. It's been a while since I looked at that one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and so you could have like, you could have your miniature golden dragon or miniature silver dragon, a miniature black dragon, whatever you you choose. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, hmm, I made a College of the Piper, uh, totally based on the story of the Pied Piper. More, multiple people have done like, you know, Piper Bard, uh, but mine actually uses the story as the inspiration for all of their subclass abilities. Like they have the ability to uh, summon rats. And or call rats and have them come. They don't just appear on the battlefield, but they they come over the course of time, um, and they can you know charm them and lead them around. And later they can do that to people as well. And they can pick specific people. For instance, you know, children under the age of twelve, um, or adult males who bake bread. You know, they they get to pick who they're going to call to them, and and they can do that. That's one of the higher level things. But basically, it is all taking inspiration from the story of the Pied Piper. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Um, what about the cleric? Clerics? Well, I have 20 different uh, gods in my homebrew campaign world, and all of them have their own things. And a lot of not a lot of them that were published quite fit. Uh, so I have ones like the agriculture domain. It's not a very combat based one, but it is definitely a flavor for one for world building. And you can still play it as a, as a player character. It is usable. It's just not as combat heavy as a lot of the other domains are. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have fun with it. Um, I have had it used in my stories with, you know, a unique way of bringing people back from the dead. That's not coded in, but it's, I used it as inspiration during playtime. Um, and let's see. I made a weather domain. I have a god. <laughs> Actually, in my game, both of these would be for the same god because he's the god of weather and agriculture. But I wasn't quite satisfied with all the weather stuff being under the Tempest domain. I love the Tempest Domain. I played a Tempest Domain cleric for a long time. So much fun. Um, but this one's more general weather, not just thunder and lightning. So it's it's more broad-based. It can be gentle rains. It can be storms. It can be whatever weather it is. This is a, the weather domain um, overall. And those, those are just two of them that I've got out of the, the many. Forgive me if I can't if the amusement of of a Midwestern nerd not being satisfied with the with a weather system. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yep. Born I'm, and raised in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, you know how it is. If you don't like the weather, wait ten minutes. Yep. Uh, in fact, totally. I wouldn't be surprised if you made as as an encounter a literal old man winter in all but name. Uh, I have not, but I've made an Archfey of Winter. And mm -hmm. she's in the book. Mm -hmm. 
And because it's and an archfade, a, a is probably doing things that make no sense. Well, make no sense to us. When I played her in the game, she's very whimsical. Like, you know, she brings winter weather, but also enjoys snowball fights and making snow angels. Mm -hmm. Because she's a fae. Yeah. (laughs) Well, let's not... I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up how the winter carnival was made kind of out of spite. (laughs) (laughs) But... Then we have the most mysterious of classes, the Druid. Sorry, the Druid. Druid. Yes, yes, the Druid. Yes, I had to do a mystery of the Druids joke. I'm legally required to. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to say one of the first ones. And this seems to be requested all the time online. People wish they had it and wish they had it. So I made the Circle of the Green, which is a plant Druid. Mm-hmm. When you wild shape, you get to turn into plants. Like uh, like twig blights or tree ants or shambling mounds, mm-hmm. um, and then you get more plant spells and abilities, and mm-hmm. uh, it's plant druid. Yeah, and, and then yeah, the for whatever reason that there, whenever it comes to druids, there's always run running joke I've I've used. I'm the Lorax. I speak for the trees. Don't listen to these ones. They speak Vietnamese. I've not heard that one before. Uh, I mean, we, I mean, people have pl- made plenty of hippie and tree hugger jokes about about druids. So why not go? F- if we're gonna go stupid, let's go all in on it. Yeah, it, it's it's you know it's it's green. It's trees. Mm-hmm. There's there's so much. <laughs> I lived in Arizona for 16 years before I came back to Wisconsin, and stuff is so much more green here. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. Um, you spent you spent sixteen years in Mordor. <laughs> yeah. Well, then for druids, we also got uh, you know the opposite of like plants. You've got creatures that eat other creatures. We have the circle of the predator, mm-hmm. uh, and that one you, uh, it's more of a combat based one using your wild shape, of course, um, but you get uh, stronger predator forms and. Later on, when you eat things while you're wild shaped, eat other creatures, it heals you. So imagine, uh, you know, wild shaping into a T-Rex and then eating an enemy and feeling better afterwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so depending on, just remember, oh, you know how they say you can't eat anything bigger than your head? Well, you can if you're willing to work for it. True. Full disclosure, I am not advocating anyone try and eat anything bigger than their head. Literally, I do, if someone does, I take no responsibility. Exactly. But unless you're a snake. <laughs> yeah, but they don't yeah, but they don't count. They're snakes. No step on snake. But next on the list, of course, we have the fighter. Oh, fighters, yeah. Um fighters are a challenge because you want to make something interesting that's not just giving them spells because if you wanted to play a spellcaster then play a spellcaster also or play we, already have that, we already have that with stuff like eldritch knight yeah um one of the ones i made is called the ablative knight and basically this one takes the role of tank and puts it into D. they have abilities that uh, get enemies' attention and draw their attacks to them instead of their party members, and they have abilities to shrug off that damage. Um, but ablation is like where something protects something else by being worn away, um, like a like a, a shield that's chipped away. Well, in this case, it's the fighter's hit points, um, but they have get damage resistance, so they last longer. But they attract those at- attacks to them instead of their party members. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 the tank role. It's the tank knight uh, for D anD. d A lot of people, you know, come from video games where you have the tank role that does that thing. You know, tracks the attacks, and you can do that easier in a video game than you can in D anD. d But I put them in as the blade of knight. Yeah, and I know some. I know some will argue that the fighter's always been the tank, but there hasn't been a um, incentive for that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, why attack the guy in the bulky heavy armor when there's that very dangerous wizard right there who's not wearing any armor? Mm-hmm. Just aim at the wizard. 
Yeah. Well, this guy attracts the attacks. Uh-huh. So and... ne- next up would be of co- would be of course my gimmick. <laughs> oh, the monk. The monk. Oh, I have so much fun with the monk. Um, well, we'll bypass my my personal rewrite of the four elements monk and go with the way of the storm's light. Uh, and this is basically a speed monk. That was my idea when I was di- designing. I make him fast, make him fast, make him fast, and so. They go faster than other monks. Uh, and then we add in a little lightning in there. Because, you know, fast things and speed and lightning. and uh, So it's kind of like a little inspiration from the Flash. A little inspiration from Raiden from Mortal Kombat. Um, so they get some teleportation abilities. You know, mm-hmm. you know, going away in a flash of lightning. They get to do a little lightning damage. Uh, but the primary thing is speed. So like... Almost right away, when you take the monk's speed bonus, they get double that. All the time. So, does their speed apply to the, apply to their movement with it within their own square, or is it ju- or is it just the movement when it comes to moving but moving between um, spaces on move on move actions? It's it's pretty much it just gets added to their move move speed, mm-hmm. the the constant one. Um, and then they have to spend uh, like key points if they want to do lightning damage. But they can do a thing where, you know, when they run, they shock everything along the path mm-hmm. that they just went. Yeah. Um, and one of their higher level abilities is they can build up so much speed. And I think it's called uh, Bow to the Storm, where they can run into something and knock it down. Even like giants and dragons. So they don't believe in walls. I mean, they're monks. They can run up walls eventually. <laughs> and, oh, I, run, you know, I run up the wall when you can run through it. Yeah, they don't. They don't get the the you know the flashes phasing or anything. But you know, eventually they can they can teleport. So I wasn't saying know, anything about phasing. I'm saying run through the thing I'll, like a wrecking I'll ball. Smash through it. Yeah, <laughs> smash through it. That could hurt. They'd still be hitting the wall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's cre- creatures they knock down. Yeah. Uh, which. In that regard, it ha- in that regard it actually has more in common with the fourth edition monk, which I never played because no. <laughs> I, I I just never had a reason to. Yeah. So. And then another opposite end of the monk is the way of the tranquil path. These are monks that are so calm and peaceful that the universe basically says, "I'm going to be nice to you." And so it's hard for creatures to land attacks on them. It, it, as long as that monk hasn't attacked them, hasn't made an attack themselves, they're much harder to hit. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, they have an ability to just talk to people and aggravate them and draw their attacks to them, kind of like the Blade of Night does. But it's just in conversation. It's a, it's a subliminal taunt, basically. And so people attack them, have a harder time hitting them instead of, you know, their companions. And then, you know, missing is, is frustrating, so you just keep attacking them until you can hit them because it's so annoying that you can't hit them. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the that's the whole idea behind that one. They get other abilities as well, but mm-hmm. that's that's the basis. That they're just so calm and peaceful and frustrating because you can't hit them. <laughs> so Paladin. The... Paladins are actually the toughest for me to write for because they have those those tenets of their oath. And that's actually one of the, the hardest parts to write for Paladin for me. Uh, but when you think about Paladins, you think about like Oathbreakers as the evil Paladin. Well, I came up with the Oath of Terror. They use fear as their weapon and they can, uh, when things are, are supposed to be frightening them, they can get stronger. So would it be fair to say that they are meant to encom- encompass that Black Knight archetype? Totally could be, yep. Or you could even play as like a Batman version. You know, because Batman's, you know, part of his shtick is, you know, scaring the, scaring the bad guys. Mm-hmm. You could do that as a paladin. You could be an Oath of Terror paladin who's kind of a good guy. Just however you want to roleplay it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could, I could certainly see that. Uh-huh. So 
Next is the one class that's probably been the most cursed class since day one. <laughs> the Ranger. <laughs> I have fun with Rangers. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, one of them I have is the Ghostly Hunter. Um, basically, they're all about stalking things. And they eventually can walk through walls like a ghost. Mm -hmm. And they can turn incorporeal for a moment to protect themselves from an attack. So they bas they basically get some ghost powers. They don't get to like possess anyone, but they can certainly follow them constantly anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have uh, the ones that just won't die. These are one of my favorites. Is the Revenant? You, as, as the Ranger, you basically pick something you're going to kill, mm -hmm. and you you can track them more easily, you can damage them more easily, um, and later on, if there's something you've set yourself, some creature you've set yourself to kill, and you die, you have a better chance of coming back. Um, you know, from a raised, you know, a lot of DMs have rules that, you know, you don't always come back from a resurrection or a raised dead or whatever. You know, there might be a role for it. Well, these guys would have advantage on that because they have unfinished business. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the whole thing with Revenant is they just keep going after their chosen prey, their chosen enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get, I can get that. And part of the reason I said their curse is because of the history that they've had since the days of AD and D. Oh. Mostly because it's kind of hard to do a outdoorsy kind of archetype when you're going to be in dungeons. All the time, especially. Oh, exactly. Time. Yeah, um, yeah. I I don't center them just on the outdoors. I center them more on a more of a a I'd say a wild, you know, like a, a semi non civilized. So the connections to nature or connections to uh, particular creatures or something that sets them as could be dangerous. Even if their personality is not. I've I've told people think less of Legolas and think more of Rambo. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I've got one a, a third one that's a little bit based on Constantine. Mm -hmm. You know, fighting aberrations and demons and stuff. Mm -hmm. But next would be the rogue. The rogue. Uh, well, something everybody's looking forward to uh, always is the acrobat. From f first edition, AD and D came out. The acrobat was one of the possibilities as a rogue. Um, it was like an alternate class, kind of like illusionist was to the magic user. Um, I have them as uh, acrobats and experts with the quarterstaff. Mm -hmm. Based, you know, kind of playing off the nineteen eighties cartoon a little bit there. Yeah. Um, they can use it for vaulting and for attacks and they get, you know, like the bonus actions attack. They, they treat a quarter staff as, you know, two weapons. Um, and eventually, you know, they can defend themselves with it and, and they just get super good at, you know, all your acrobatic stuff. Yeah, because the, the, way you said, the way you said it, if they're, if, um, the, if the paladin of, if the paladin of terror, the oath of terror is supposed to is can lean into Batman. It sounds like the acrobat rogue could lean into um, Dick Grayson. Oh, sure, totally. I didn't even think of that, but yeah, <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, and then let's go with uh, nope, that one's not in the book because that was too recent. Sorry, <laughs> I made one in May. Um, and nothing, all the stuff that I made in the book is either specific to the book or made before December 1st of last year. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm constantly making new stuff and putting it online like more, two or more times a week. Um, let's see. You know how when you're online, people have a problem spelling the word rogue? Yeah, and I, is, you made one called the Rouge. The Rouge Rager. So yes, I made a Rouge Rogue. Um, <laughs> and and basically they they get to go into a rage. And and there is the uh, a bit with, you know, 
like blood or the color red mixed into the the subclass features. Um, but the, the basic feature is, is here's a rogue that can rage. And while they're raging, they don't have to use finesse weapons to get sneak attack in. So you could have one, you know, they may not be proficient. They may, uh, depends on, you know, your multi-class or whatever, you know, wielding a, a, a great sword and sneak attacking with it mm-hmm. while they're raging. So that was a fun one and, and totally based on a spelling error. Yeah. That I saw, you know, like just yesterday too. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen, I've seen, I think there was one other person who had, who had done, who had done that a while back, but it's an amu- it's an amusing uh, bit of bit of a spelling error because well it's it's gonna ha- it's gonna happen yeah it's it's gonna happen and rouge is an actual word so type so spell checkers aren't gonna catch it <laughs> mm-hmm. you know it's a type of makeup it's a color so I went with the color version yeah I could I could certainly get that so. Obviously, next would be the sorcerer, along with mm-hmm. his horse, sorcerer. <laughs> okay, uh, sorcerer. Um, one of my favorite ones. I haven't even gotten to play it myself. Uh, it's called Fleeting Presence as a sorcerer's origin. This is the teleporting sorcerer. They're really, really good at teleportation magic. Um, and I actually made a bunch of new teleportation spells to go along with it, um, just because there's really not that many in D&D. Um, but yeah, teleportation, teleportation, mm-hmm. teleportation. Yep. Uh, and then a fun one I actually got the name of from a uh, a Dresden Files book. But the name sounded cool, so I used it as a sorcerer, and it's called the Hexen Wolf. This one is only in the book. You can't find and you, It's not on my website. Um, basically, they get their power from being a werewolf. And it's tied to the moon or moons. Mm-hmm. So you know, they get to turn into a wolf, and later a werewolf, and then they get some other abilities related to werewolves. So it's a werewolf sorcerer. All right, and then the warlock. Warlocks. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the dragon. Everybody makes one of those. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I made several warlock subclasses based on the names of pact boons. Um, so one of them was Pact of the Chain. Well, I made a, a patron called the Chains of Creation. That's like primordial mystical chains that hold reality together. And somehow the warlocks have learned about it and, you know, gained access to his power. So they get abilities for, uh, like, mending things and binding things in mystical chains uh, and eventually creating things from scratch, like a uh, like I think their highest level ability is they can make a fortress out of nothing temporarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was the chains of creation, um, and then uh, we have the winter archfey, which I had mentioned earlier as an as a, a character, um, but I actually made it as a warlock subclass because I wanted a mix of like wintry features along with features from the archfey that already existed. And so that's what that is. It's a mix. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Oh. And when it come, and of course the last on the list would be actually before I get to that since you mentioned that you made some based on the different um, pact boons. Mm-hmm. I'm curious if you did one on the pact of the sword. I the pact of the blade, yes. Um, I called it the witch blade, and it's basically a remix, reflavor of some stuff from the hex blade, because I never really liked all the lore stuff that was attached to it. You know, my personal game world doesn't have a Shadowfell. It doesn't have a Raven Queen. It doesn't have, um, I think it was the hex blade, like an actual like weapon or something. It doesn't have those. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted, you know, like a melee one based on, on the Pact of the Blade uh, as as a name. So that's the Witchblade name, of course, comes from a comic and like a TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's 
where that one's the witchblade, and and your 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 patron is the weapon in this case. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> You're dealing with a some, living weapon, like, I, I suppose. The closest a-, a close analog I could think of would be Stormbringer. Oh, yeah, I have to refresh my memory on that one. From the uh, from the Elric series of books, part of the, part of the whole Eternal Champion meta series by Moorcock. Okay, set of books I have not read. Oh. <laughs> but the last class on the list would be the wizard, or if you're Terry Pratchett, the <clears throat> wizard. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. You know how uh, in a lot of times you hear about games where like arcane magic is illegal. You can't cast wizard spells without, you know, being attacked or going to jail or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had heard that so many times and actually I was (laughs) going into a game where that was part of the premise. And so, of course, I wanted to play a wizard uh, just because of that. But I came up with a school of uh, the arcane tradition of clandestine wizardry. These are spellcasters who hide their magical abilities and conceal it and you know cast without you know somatic components eventually uh, a certain number of times they don't totally step on the sorcerer's feet that way uh, until they get high enough level when their magic is just developed enough that they can overcome anti-magic mm-hmm. at least for themselves so they can they could you know oh i'm caught in an anti-magic you know 14th 16th level character oh, well, i'm caught in an anti-magic field and i need to escape well i'm still going to be able to teleport I can't cast a fireball on, you know, those people right over there, but I can get away. Or I can cast, you know, mage armor on myself or something. That's their their highest level thing is being able to just still do some magic. No no matter how hard people try to stop them from doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, another one I call uh, the arcane tradition of spell thievery. And this is one of my favorite ones. Basically, you know so much about spells and what powers them that when somebody else casts a spell, you can draw some of the magical energy out of that spell as it's being cast. And possibly use it yourself. Um, It weakens the other spell, so people get advantage on saves, or the spell attack has disadvantage. Um, Later on, you can get whole spell slots out of it Mm -hmm. to cast your own spells. And borrow, you know, the copy, the knowledge to cast spells. Um, It never actually removes the ability to cast spells from other characters or other creatures. But at their highest level, they could go up against a cleric and basically pull away magic and get a spell slot along with a cleric spell that they wouldn't normally be able to cast and be able to cast it. Mm Mm-hmm. So their their whole thing is stealing this. It's more stealing the spell energy, and then later pirating the spell knowledge. It's not mm-hmm. just taking it so the other person doesn't have it, but it's giving yourself a copy of it. Yeah, the way you describe it, I'm reminded of the spell thief concept back in the old Aquadine books. Mm-hmm. Uh, who was well exactly what it sounds like on the tin. <laughs> <laughs> Now, shifting from shifting from that, one of the big th- one of the big things I noticed when I looked at the bullet points was the concept of fighting styles and martial techniques. Oh, yes. What exactly is that? Is that going to entail? Is fighting styles like a, a branch off of feats? Is it a optional feature? How how is fighting styles going to be working? Uh, the extra fighting styles are. Basically, just extra fighting styles, just yeah. like fighting styles that are already in there, mm-hmm. um, except, well, there's more of them, and uh, fighters are going to get more of them. Barbarians are going to get them. Paladins get them. Even rogues get a fighting style, just not as quick, not as soon, not just not as soon as the fighter, and not as many as the fighter. So I gave more options, but I also say have more. <laughs> So it's it's not just you get one and then maybe you get another one at a higher level. It's mm-hmm. you know fighters get one and then they get another one and then they can get another one and um, and then you know champions of course would still get more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I don't leave them out. I I like the champion. It's relatively simple, but it's fun to play. It's a it gets knocked. 
Yeah, it's a crit fisher. It gets he gets knocked all the time as it is boring, but you know what? Sometimes that's just fun. You focus more on the role play, you focus more on the overwhelming things. Yeah. Um so I, I don't have any problem with the champion. But with this, they get more fighting styles. Mm -hmm. And then the martial techniques are more of a they're kind of like power moves. Some of them are limited the number of times you can use them. Some of them aren't. Um, I have it split into four different tiers. And, you know, f pure martial characters like fighters, they get mm -hmm. they get them sooner and they get more of them. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, like, even paladins and rangers can get them. Uh, rogues, monks, um, they can get these these techniques. Uh, and, and they're yeah, they're basically power moves. And yeah, they get more powerful as they go up in level. Uh, and it could be anything from, you know, like firing arrows faster or, um, you know, really being able to plow through enemies when you make a bolt, like a, a, a bull's charge. Uh, there's one of them, you know, you can, one of the higher level ones, you leap up and you smash the ground with your weapon and you actually cause like a small localized earthquake. You know, I, I basically took the ideas of what can... Uh, like these super skilled warriors in like TV shows and movies and anime do that's not just casting spells. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not so so skilled that suddenly they're doing magic. They're just, it's just amping up the expectations. Like one of them is, you know, you can like hit an enemy so fast with your, your sword and make, you know, such a cutting thing that, you know, you can kill them, but they don't realize it right away. That's one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's that's what the martial techniques are. And there's, I think I've got 46 of them is what I ended up with. Yeah, and so th there's choices to be made. You know, they're not all going to, not all of them, all of them are going to be as optimal as others, but that's part of making choices. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how do you want to play this character? Yeah, I get, I can get that. Now, going, f going further into that you're you're adding um condition you're adding actions like guard and taunt um uh, yes uh they're they're not too tim too difficult uh the, like the guard action um basically you take an action to guard a person you're near and you can intercept attacks going to them mm -hmm. um whereas the taunt action is <laughs> you're making fun of the enemy or you're you're literally taunting them trying to get them to attack you instead of somebody else and that's one of those ones where you know, the mechanic behind it is they have disadvantage attacking other people because they're focused on you. Mm -hmm. They can still attack other creatures, but they're they're not going to do as well. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. And even with even with all that, this is still going to be a very beefy book. There's still a, a lot of that. <laughs> if, like I said, if we went if we went through even just the highlights of a lot of the stuff in, in it, we'd be here for quite a while. Yeah, it is 575 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as the status of, of it currently, is, is it a case where most of the text is already done, barring a few editing passes? Oh, the text is done. The editing has been done. Mm -hmm. the, the What it needs, I and I'm working on right now, is some illustrations for the NPC and monster chapters. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it is finished. It's all laid out. It's all edited. It is. Well, I did add a disease the other day, but <laughs> then I had to edit 16 pages uh, with the layout um, to fit that in. But otherwise, it's done. Mm -hmm. It is. So um, I'll have things like in the back of the book where I'm going to be adding uh, if people choose the uh, VIP backer add on, they can get their name printed in the book. Or if they. Uh, choose the one they can get a group added to the book. So it could be like the names of the people in your uh, your your playgroup, or it could be the names of their adventurers in their in the in the party. Mm -hmm. So they can add that. That'll be afterwards, but that'll be relatively easy to add because it'll be at the very back of the book, and I won't have to adjust everything <laughs> like it would if I added new spells or new feats or anything like that where it would shift around everything that comes after. Mm -hmm. I can get, but, I can get yeah, that. The, the book is, I, I call it 99% done. Yeah. 
Uh, with that, with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a ballpark of sorts. Okay, I am saying on the Kickstarter March of twenty twenty five. But that's to account for anything that doesn't go smoothly. Yeah. Um, if everything went absolutely perfect, it might be a couple months before that. Mm -hmm. I could, I could potentially see that, and it'd be real funny if you launched if the launch date was the fourth of March. What yeah. was the fourth of March? You know, so you could tell people March fourth and get and get the and get the book. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. That makes that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> well, I, I can't uh, do that. Um, because it's Kickstarter, and I, I, the books haven't been printed. I have a print company lined up. It's all ready to go, um, which is what I'm raising money for. That is, for the Kickstarter, my initial goal is the cost to print a minimum print run of the hardcover book and to cover Kickstarter's fees on that money. Because mm. Kickstarter takes 10%, 8 to 10%. Which, yeah. Eh, you know what? They provide a service. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I, I realize that that would be that would be quite an ask to do that. But, um, a yeah. guy can dream, can't he? Yep. Yeah, and you know, if it's if I get forty percent over the goal, I'll be able to order enough books that game stores can get wholesale pricing from me, so they could sell it to their customers which would be amazing because I would love to see it on the stores of a friendly local game mm -hmm. store on the shelves. Mm -hmm. uh, if that happens, it's not going to show up on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or these other ones that can, you know, seriously undercut your local game store. It's going to be myself and it's going to be local game stores. That's where it'll be available in the future. You know, if it gets up to enough funding. Mm hmm. Which but I can, I can certainly get that. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, yeah. I am going to take a moment and plug that there's also hunt over 400 spells mm -hmm. for your spellcasters and over 500 magic items for you DMs out there to use. Mm hmm and even then there's more stuff than that. It is the Amethyst Dragon's Horde of everything. Because it is everything I, I have made up until December of last year. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And anytime you see it fit to return, the door is always open. As, oh yeah, I, I love return trips. Yeah. As I often see as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. <laughs> oh. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, Stay fucking frosty, everybody!